Hi guys, it's me Chazar HD and welcome to a podcast episode, something that I've not done in a few years, I think since like 2019 or something like that. And what I'm doing today is trying something new. Um, I've been thinking about doing this post a Grand Prix for a few weeks now. And yeah, I'm just going to try out and uh, see how this goes. And well, after what we got uh, at the Red Bull ring on Sunday, there is quite a bit to talk about that I do want to talk about with you guys and just share my thoughts as to you know what happened at the Austrian Grand Prix. And it was a... Slow burner, for sure, was the Austrian Grand Prix. We had, what, 50, 50, 55 laps of nothing, really? And then after Max and Lando's final pit stop, it just came alive and was a, you know, turned into a, a classic Grand Prix after that. And it was completely out of nowhere. But, um, yeah, let's go through, you know, some of what happened over the course of the Austrian Grand Prix weekend. But we have to start, of course, with Max Verstappen versus Lando Norris. Now, what we saw eventually happen on Sunday, you know, the last few laps of the race, was something that was brewing up ever since Friday, really. And you could say even before that, you know, going back to Spain with, you know, Norris pushing Max onto the grass slightly at the start of, the, of uh, that Grand Prix, you know, you could go back even further and say that, you know, because Max and Lando have been, you know, consistently at the top in the last few races so often that we were going to get something like this at some point uh, very soon. Um, but, you know, in Austria, you know, on Friday, Max and Lando were first and second, less than a tenth of a second separating them. And in the sprint race, we got, for the first few laps, a, a brilliant sprint race. We had Lando repeatedly, lap after lap, having a go at Max Verstappen, trying to overtake it eventually. Can't remember uh, what lap exactly it was, but he did get past at turn three. But then, as he said after the sprint, he made a amateur mistake by leaving the inside line open into turn four. And then Max Verstappen dived back up the inside, took the position. Oscar Piastri, uh, Lando's teammate, of course, then re or not retook, but you know took the position from Lando, um, and that was a taste of what we were gonna get towards the end of the Austrian Grand Prix on Sunday. Thankfully, Max and Lando still um, ended up first and second in the main qualifying on Saturday. Lando wasn't able to get anywhere near Max on uh, Saturday qualifying, which made me think, going into the race, and this is why I didn't stream for the race, that Max was going to dominate. And again, up until that final pit stop, Max was dominating that race. He was, what, six to seven seconds clear, he was having a bit of trouble with the back markers because of his um, lack of pace because he was on old tyres compared to, I think, the two Haas cars that were right behind him. But except for that, he was comfortable. He was going to win the Austrian Grand Prix. But then when we got to that final pit stop, Red Bull had, for once, a very bad pit stop. They lost about, I think it was it, three and a half, four seconds to Lando and McLaren. And then... For some reason, the Red Bull, coming out of the pit stop, just didn't have really any good pace. And we do see this with other cars where sometimes they go into a set of tyres and the car just doesn't feel as good. That's what Max said on the radio after the final pit stop, that the car just did not feel good at all. Um, but yeah, it was just suddenly a completely different race now where you know McLaren was suddenly a few tenths of a second faster than Red Bull, and Lando was now able to have a proper go at Verstappen to win the Austrian Grand Prix. And eventually, it did end with contact between Max and Lando, but before we get to that point, I do have to say that Max Verstappen, with some of his defensive driving, um, in you know, on, on the certain occasions where Lando attempted to overtake before we got to the collision... Max definitely was pushing the uh, the rule book, let's say. He was moving under braking, going into the braking zone of turn three. There is no doubt about that. 
He wasn't, though, doing it as blatantly as I think people think he was. He was definitely doing it, but it wasn't as uh, blatant as we've seen with other drivers moving under braking. And I've definitely seen Verstappen do it a lot worse than what he did um, at Turn 3. But Lando, even though Max was doing that, Lando did have a couple good chances before that collision to properly overtake Max and you know, properly take the lead and go on to win the race. There was the, you know, where uh, the lap where Lando went up the inside, went too deep, went off the track, um, and then, you know, Max ended up going back through. Then there was also, I think, a couple, was it a lap or two before the collision, where Lando went up the inside and Max went wide off the track and rejoined in the lead. So, even though, yeah, Max's defensive driving was on the edge or maybe just slightly over it, let's not pretend like Lando did not have his chances to get that overtake done. And with Max, you know, him defending in that way, it's not exactly a surprise. We know that he does that sort of thing. We've seen it when he's raced Lewis Hamilton, you know, a million times. He's even done it at times with Charles Leclerc. We've seen it, you know, with other drivers as well when he's raced other drivers. Obviously, it's not been a, a common sight over the last couple of years, him wheel to wheel that often. But it's not a new thing with, you know, for Stappen. And there has been a couple drivers that, not all the time, but some of the time, have still been able to get past him and properly beat him in whatever Grand Prix it was. And the fact of the matter is, even though Max, yeah, was moving under braking, Lando had two clear opportunities at least, if not more, to pass Verstappen and win the Austrian Grand Prix. But the, again, the first one just went too deep, went wide. And then the second one, he ended up, uh, you know, pushing Max off the track. And then when we came to the collision, which was on lap, 64 I think it was out of 71 Max was on the approach to turn 3 middle of the track Lando decided to go for the outside line to try and get a better exit from turn 3 try something different compared to what he did before and Max if you go back and I'll try and show this on screen but if you go back and look at especially the footage Max does just slightly inch over to the left not completely to the left of course but he does move over to the left enough that Lando, because of how quickly Lando is approaching into turn three, that's why contact is made. And Max, I think, definitely was at fault for why there was contact. I, I will say, though, that I was a bit surprised at the penalty because I did think that the Max and Lando collision at turn three was more of a racing incident, even though I thought Max was, you know, more so at fault for why that collision happened. Um, but it was a shame, really, because it was a great battle. And even though, yeah, Max wasn't maybe defending in the most legal way possible, it was a brilliant battle. And it would have, if they had not collided on that lap and not collided at all, it would have gone down to the final lap, no doubt about it, uh, because that McLaren was just so damn quick in those final few laps. Um, and then obviously they made contact, both caused each other a puncture. Lando did get a five-second penalty for an incident a couple laps before where he, you know, when he tried to overtake Verstappen, went up the inside, but then went too deep and off the track. Did get a five-second penalty for exceeding track limits too many times, which maybe if that penalty was given before, maybe that would have prevented a crash. Who knows? Maybe that would have allowed uh, or forced Lando to be a bit more cautious going in to turn three from, um, you know, after the lap where he went off uh, trying to pass Verstappen. But I think most likely that collision would have happened anyway because Lando was absolutely determined to overtake Verstappen and get the lead. Uh, but yeah, Verstappen was able to continue in the race, got a, a, a what was it, I think a 10 second penalty, still ended up finishing fifth and getting the fastest lap. Lando, though, retired from the race so Verstappen actually ended up gaining more points over his main championship rival than he was going to anyway if he won the race and Lando finished in second um but yeah 
Um, quite incredible finish to the Austrian Grand Prix. And we'll see how this affects things when it comes to Max and Lando. Because obviously, you know, they are great friends. Uh, Lando, after the race, did say that, you know, if Max doesn't admit fault, basically, that, you know, it's going to be hard for a, a friendship after that. Um, which I hope they don't turn into massive enemies, honestly, because what happened was, I think, um, you know, it wasn't quite as bad as I think certain people are trying to make out. And it would be sad if, you know, he threw away a friendship over something that was, um, you know, I think in hindsight, it wasn't, um, it, you know, we've seen incidents between top drivers in the last few years that have been way worse than what we saw um, up, at, uh, up at turn three. So, yeah, it would be a shame if that friendship was to end. Um, but one thing in a positive way for us fans, it does give us, is a, a rivalry. Because we haven't had a rivalry really since maybe Max and Leclerc in 2022 at times. But obviously, the last big one, Max and Lewis in 2021. So... Maybe going forward now for the rest of this year, maybe into next year, it's going to be Max versus Lando as the main rivalry in Formula 1. And maybe we'll get more battles like this. And maybe we'll get some uh, very hard, but hopefully fair racing between the two. And it definitely makes this coming British Grand Prix this weekend very much anticipated because... You'd expect Red Bull and McLaren, who currently have the two best cars, to be the two best teams this weekend around a track that suits their cars very well. And Lando, of course, at his home Grand Prix. Uh, and after what happened in Austria, it's, you know, the perfect place really for revenge. But as we've seen with Max, you know, he is relentless. He is, uh, he's not going to give up uh, without a fight, if even if he's in a slower car. So it could set us up for something very special this weekend or going forward for the rest of the season. Max still is going to win the championship in 2024. Um, I don't think Lando has a chance of winning the championship because he's just too far behind at this point. Um, he would have really, Lando, had to have won this week, uh, this you know, Grand Prix that's just gone and the Spanish Grand Prix, I think, to really get a championship bid going but yeah at this point I just think he's too far behind given that we are what halfway through the season basically at this point um but yeah it was very controversial thankfully though you know it wasn't um a lot worse um which it could have been it could have been a lot worse uh, of a, a crash because it was getting even more tense each lap that they were going side by side but that's my view on the incident. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, again, I think Max was more so at fault for the collision. But again, I thought it was more of a racing incident. I didn't think it was like a clear slam dunk 10 second penalty. But if you disagree, that's absolutely fine. And I can see why. Um, but yeah, really, really hoping that we get Max versus Lando yet again this weekend at Silverstone. But of course, those two colliding meant that third place at the time, Mercedes driver George Russell, who was struggling a bit towards the end on his tyres, his uh, like hard compound tyres, ended up sweeping through and just about by a couple seconds winning the Austrian Grand Prix. Mercedes' first win in Formula 1 in... Uh, I think, what, 18 months, 17 months, something like that. It is incredible that it has been that long since Mercedes last won a Grand Prix in Formula 1. And with the form that Russell has been in the last few weeks, it's been... I wouldn't say it's been coming, necessarily, you know, Russell winning a race, but I think it's been, you know, if there was going to be uh, an opportunity to come about through, you know, collision between two drivers, if there was going to be an opportunity to come about for someone else to snatch a race win that seemed very unlikely, George Russell has been one of those drivers that has been at the head of that pack to try and uh, to do that because he has been very consistent this year. Yeah, he's had a couple crashes, but most of the time has been very consistent and has done just, you know, the best job he can. And, you know, him running in third 
for uh, pretty much the whole Grand Prix up until that crash. He was doing a great job hanging on to those tyres because he had, I think, what, Sainz and Piastri only a couple seconds back really pushing hard to get after him. But ended up, yeah, taking the race win. He's uh, now right in the mix in the Drivers' Championship. Not that many points behind, um, I think, Perez, Sainz, and, of course, even Leclerc at this point, who, of course, did not score any points in the Austrian Grand Prix. So great to see for uh, Mercedes and Russell getting a win. Obviously, it is, it is uh, George Russell's second win in Formula One, his first one, obviously, in Brazil in 2022. Mercedes, um, still, though, as we have seen in the last couple of races, even though they have improved with their car, no doubt about it, if they're going to get to the point where they are properly able on pace to fight Red Bull and McLaren for race wins, they still need another big upgrade because they're still a bit too far away. And of course, you can't rely on collisions with others, um, you know, to win Grand Prix because it doesn't happen very often. So Mercedes still work to do, but good to see that they are performing a lot better now than they were you know, three months ago where they were a lot closer to being a midfield team than to being anywhere near the front of the Formula 1 grid. Um, Oscar Piastri, he ended up finishing in second place ahead of Carlos Sainz in third. We'll get on to Sainz and uh, Ferrari in a moment, but what could have been for Oscar Piastri? Um, obviously had a lap time deletion in qualifying, for running too wide at, was it turn, or in between turn six and seven, I think it was, right before the middle sector time beam, which is complete bullshit that he got a lap time deletion because he touched the gravel. He didn't gain any time from being out there on that part of the track, yet the FIA delete the time. He ended up going down from, uh, what was it, from third down to P7, and ultimately, I mean, you never know if Piastri has started third, maybe he gets involved in a collision on the first lap. That easily, yes, could have happened. But if Piastri starts in third place instead of P7, Oscar Piastri probably in Austria would have taken his first ever Grand Prix victory with, you know, Max and Lando having their collision. So, yeah, what could have been for Piastri? Great drive by Piastri, I have to say, though. Um, you know, slowly but surely made his way through the field. Great pass on Perez round the outside at, I think, turn six it was. Um, also passed Hamilton at turn three. And then a great move also on Carlos Sainz in the last few laps. And just ran out of laps, really, to try and get after Russell. But, yeah, that, that penalty, or not penalty, but that lap time deletion is what cost him uh, winning the Grand Prix did uh, Piastri but this weekend at Silverstone as we saw last year Piastri should be very quick at this circuit plus McLaren will be so maybe if Max and Lando have some more shenanigans Piastri could take his first Formula One win this weekend keep an eye out for him at Silverstone but uh, yeah Carlos Sainz he ended up in third place and um, was very quiet during the Grand Prix. We only really saw him when he passed Lewis Hamilton, who let him back through because of, um, I think, something that happened at the start where Hamilton may have overtook Sainz off the track. Um, and then, um, obviously, we saw him towards the end with Piastri getting overtook for second place, but largely was a quiet race. And I think Carlos did well to be only, you know, two or three seconds behind Russell, the race winner in the end, and still be competitively in there because Ferrari have absolutely fallen off a cliff as we have seen in the last few weeks um what five six weeks ago in Monaco they were the kings of Monaco their car looked brilliant and now they are the fourth best team that's how quickly they have gone down the order it is quite incredible um, just how bad their pace is at the moment. In qualifying, they were consistently slow in both sprint and proper uh, qualifying. Also, for Charles Leclerc, just a disastrous weekend that 
partly, you know, he has to share blame for, for, you know, the uh, mistake in qualifying at the end of Q3, where he just pushed a little too hard and ended up um, going off the track. Um, you know, if that didn't happen, maybe Leclerc could have ended up on the second row of the grid and maybe um, had been in there with, you know, fighting Russell and you never know, could have taken a podium or maybe even a race win for Austria. But mostly what happened with Leclerc was something or things that he couldn't control. Obviously got hit by Piastri on the first corner, needed a new front wing and then um, had to try and fight his way back through the field. For some reason, Ferrari put him on a four-stop strategy, which was completely unnecessary. I know he pit on the first lap for a new front wing, but Ferrari just refused to give him a long stint, uh, either uh, you know towards the start of the race or in the middle, to try and get him you know a lot longer into the race without having to waste another 23 seconds pitting. Um, See, so yeah, I'm not quite sure why Ferrari did that, but that's why Leclerc pretty much ended up finishing in 11th place. Uh, awful weekend for him. And it's such a shame because with Ferrari, of course, they were not quick um, in Austria. But Leclerc normally is the clearly quicker driver compared to you know, his teammate around this track. We've seen that in the last couple of years that Leclerc is quicker at the Red Bull ring. So for you to kind of... Um, if you're Ferrari, to not allow Leclerc to maximise his potential, uh, you know, in Austria, was really um the big part of why it was a disaster. Because Leclerc was, I think, their biggest hope for maybe a podium and some success in Austria. Because again, Leclerc normally at the Red Bull ring is super super quick, but. It was just a very messy weekend and he never really got any confidence generated because of whether it was his mistake or other things happening to him that he couldn't really um, control. He just couldn't really get things together, unfortunately. But I am, as I said in my stream on Saturday, I am very concerned with Ferrari because quite clearly their car aerodynamically is way off where it was a few weeks ago. They are clearly slower than Red Bull and McLaren. And at this point, not in all areas, but in the most important areas, they are slower now than Mercedes-Benz. And I don't see this improving probably until the summer break. Um, maybe when we come back from the summer break, maybe Ferrari can bring a big upgrade that does actually improve the car because we haven't seen any upgrades improve the car this year. And then maybe that can, you know, get the season going again. Because we have to remember, really, in the first... Maybe not all of the first seven or eight races, but but maybe most of them. You could say Ferrari were the closest team to Red Bull, um, especially in qualifying. But again, since Monaco, they they've been performing a lot more like a you know uh, maybe an upper midfield team have the Scuderia. So yeah, a lot of work to do at Ferrari, um, not just to save this season in terms of you know, maybe being able to pick up a couple more race wins. But looking ahead to 2025, if they continue in this trajectory, it's not looking good for 2025. So, yeah, we'll see if Ferrari can improve. They really have to if they're going to have some sort of confidence going into next year. In a year they hope will be maybe a championship winning year with how things are going at Red Bull. But uh, let's just touch on some other things from Austria. Uh, Sergio Perez, complete shit show from him. Um, was a second slower than Verstappen in qualifying. I don't know how you're a second slower than your teammate around a one minute, four second lap. That is incredible how bad that is. I, I just can't even put in words how um, incredibly poor a performance that was from Sergio Perez. I don't know the race... We must have missed a late Sergio Perez pit stop because for some reason he was behind the two horses. Uh, so yeah, I think he must have pitted late like Verstappen did maybe in the last 15 laps or so. Because Perez um, found himself, yeah, behind the two horses. He passed Magnussen, but in the last few laps was right behind Nico Hülkenberg and somehow didn't overtake him. Even though not only is the Red Bull car around the Red Bull ring, probably a second and a half quicker per lap than the Haas in race 
um, pace, but also the Haas had, I think, 15 lap older tyres. So how on earth did Perez not pass Hulkenberg? I'm pretty sure every other driver on the grid, even Logan Sargent, could have passed Hulkenberg in that Red Bull. So, yeah, I have no idea what Perez was playing at. And as well, as people have mentioned, just to illustrate how far behind Perez is for Stappen, Max was able to have a puncture, pit, and obviously, you know, uh, had to stop for a lot longer than he usually would, had a 10-second penalty and still finished, like, what was it, 20, 25 seconds ahead of Perez. Just incredible. I, I... I honestly do not understand how Perez is performing this poorly. As you guys know, I am a Perez guy, I guess you could say. I've always liked him, but this version of Sergio Perez is by far the worst version I've ever seen. Um, and at this point, I've just given up on him showing any improvement. And the issue is, with Perez, is that he has no incentive to improve, does Checo. Because he's got a Red Bull contract for next year. May even get another contract going into the future if Red Bull don't have a clear, obvious replacement. So what's the incentive for Perez to actually try and not be that bad? There isn't any. So I think we're going to have to get used to this probably in, you know, for the rest of this year, maybe even... For uh, next year as well, it's um, it is quite sad because if we go look, you know, go back a couple years ago, just a couple years ago, twenty twenty two, Sergio Perez was pretty competitive at times with Max Verstappen, and there was a, uh, I think at one point was it around Baku or Canada, Perez was only a few points behind his teammate in the championship. Perez, you know, had won in Monaco. Um, he had, a, I think, a pole position in Saudi Arabia. Was on the podium every Grand Prix. And you look at him at the minute, it's it's like he's... Uh, it's not even the same person. It is, it is amazing, the transformation. Um, I don't even remember the last time Perez was on the podium. I think it was... When was it? Suzuka? Was, it, was Suzuka the last time he was on the podium? Which was... Yeah, three months ago, has to be. Um, yeah, Sergio Perez is finished, I would say, uh, at this point. Which is, again, it's a shame to see. Because he was, not that long ago, performing at a very high level. But that's the way it is, unfortunately. A uh, couple other things to go over. Daniel Ricciardo, just want to shout him out for a brilliant ninth place finish in the Racing Bulls car. Once again... For the second time in the last three um, um, races, uh, scoring points. But I think for the last three races now, he has uh, beaten Sonoda. So that is, you know, the perfect form he needs if he's going to stay at the Racing Bulls team. Because there is uh, talk that coming up to the summer break that there's going to be discussions between... Red Bull and Ricardo as to, you know, will Ricardo stay in the team? Will Liam Lawson take his place? If Ricardo is going to stay at the team, then all he's got to do is keep his form up right now and still, you know, grab some points here and there. And he should be fine. And based on current form, I don't see how you can drop Daniel Ricardo because he's definitely improved. There is no doubt about that. Um, he's doing well enough right now to deserve to be in that team. But will he keep it up? That's the question. We'll have to see in the final three races before the summer break, which is obviously Silverstone this weekend, and then Hungary and Spa. Some very good tracks for Ricardo. Obviously, Silverstone, plenty of times. We've seen Ricardo, you know, be very quick. At Silverstone, Hungary, of course, a track he won at, and obviously Spa, another track he won at. So. If Ricardo doesn't perform in these next three Grand Prix um, enough, then he hasn't got anyone else to blame. It's not like we've got tracks coming up that he's either you know never raced at before or he's got terrible history around. So yeah, fingers crossed Ricardo will keep this form up. Um, also, shout out the Haas team and Haas drivers. Big result for them. Sixth and eighth, uh, 12 points on the board. 
for Haas and are now clearly in, um, I think, seventh in the championship. But I think we're only about 11 points, is it, behind Racing Bulls. So that closes things up and good result for Haas and very good strategy as well, um, being aggressive and it really helped their overall result in the end and yeah brilliant result for them sixth and eighth and Hulkenberg especially what a weekend he had after the sprint race where up until you know um or after the sprint race he had had a pretty poor weekend and then from Saturday qualifying on got the absolute best out of that Haas car and had some brilliant pace through the race as well so yeah well done to him and the Haas team also, Fernando Alonso and Aston Martin got to talk about them. And Martin Brundle on uh, Sky F1 Commentary, he made the point, and it's so true, that Fernando, we don't really hear from Fernando, uh, it feels like, anymore. Even on the radio, he's just so miserable. And he has every right to be. Because that Aston Martin car, even though fundamentally it's a good car, the team just have no idea what to do with it. Um, we already know what the issues are. They put upgrades on. The car gets worse. I don't think they actually understand their car well enough. Um, which I think is the, the main issue. Uh, obviously, correlation issues have got to be a part of this. Uh, as to why these upgrades are just not doing what they should. Um, but I do feel sorry for Alonso a lot. Because... You know, we look at last year, he was one of the best drivers on the grid. He was incredible last year. And even at the start of this year, he was consistently, you know, getting the best out of the car, doing the best he could, and was, you know, one of the, still one of the top performers on the grid. But in these last couple races, uh, Spain and Austria... Aston Martin have just been devoid of any pace and devoid of any um life really to that team they're just they've been completely dead these last couple of weeks um and yeah i just have no no hope for this team going forward um i will say with alonso uh, the penalty he got in the race for contact with joe i do feel like 10 seconds was a bit harsh for that contact i don't think it was quite that bad of a, a collision he had with joe guan yu but yeah um Aston Martin just are hopeless at the moment. And, and as we saw in the race, no matter what they tried on strategy, it never really was going to work in terms of putting them in the points. They never looked likely to be in the points. The fight for the points in the midfield was between Haas, Alpine and Ricardo was in there as well because he had a pretty good strategy in the racing bull car. But even though Alonso was trying to pit early and have that advantage of fresh tyres, it never really worked out for him. Um, and then I think Lance Stroll, can't remember where he finished, but it was miles away, low down in the order. Um, so yeah, Aston Martin, just no hope. And I think I said it in my Saturday qualifying stream, and I wouldn't be surprised if this did happen, um, that I, I don't think they'll score that many more points in 2024, because I think they, I don't think they really know what to do with this car. Um, and they're only going in one direction at this point. The only thing they can do is just try and figure out, you know, what the actual problems are and try and get them fixed ahead of next season. But in terms of this season, I know they're fifth in the championship, but I don't think that is going to last, I'm afraid, for Aston Martin. Um, but yeah, that is pretty much all I wanted to talk about from the uh, Austrian Grand Prix. Um, another couple of things, though, that I do want to quickly go through is, one, the replacement guy on Sky F1, I think, is it Harry Benjamin, I think is his name? Uh, the guy who stepped in for Crofty this weekend and stepped in for Imola. He's a, a new commentator. Uh, once again, good job. Really liked his commentary. And he uh, his um, chemistry with Martin Brundle seemed pretty good, considering it was their first weekend commentating together. And I think for Martin Brundle might have been a bit awkward because, I mean, Crofty's been his commentary partner since, what, 2012, which is 12 years is a long time. Um, so, yeah, I thought they did pretty well together 
which is a good omen for the future in terms of, you know, when Crofty steps away, whenever that may be. But another thing I want to talk about is, before we go, is there was a bit of a controversy after qualifying on Saturday. Um, Yuki Tsunoda was fined, I think, 40,000 euros, was it? For um, comments he made on the radio, uh, talking about another driver uh, during qualifying, where I think there was a driver ahead of him who was slow pulling out of the pit lane, and Yuki got frustrated and said, is this guy fucking, and then said the R word or R slur. I think you guys know what that word is. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to get demonetized or anything like that. But I do feel that Sonoda was, um, you know, in terms of the people that came down on Sonoda with criticism, I do feel like people are being unfair uh, with 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 Yuki, especially when you consider the context. Now, before anyone says, "Oh, well, you know, you're just a, you know, um, a, a, say a neurotypical person who is um, who shouldn't be speaking on this because you're not affected by the word," I am not a neurotypical person. Um, I can announce, and I don't think it's really a surprise given you know the way I follow Formula One, but I do have autism. I am on the autistic. Uh, spectrum so obviously that word is you know it is the big bad word for our community but when you consider the context of you know how Sonoda would know that word and also the way it was directed I really feel like people have been unfair in their criticism now if you're another disabled person and you're offended by what Sonoda said that's fine you know, if you are offended, that's absolutely fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't be offended. I'm just, you know, this is just my personal view as a autistic person. But you know, Sonoda English is not his first language. He doesn't have, you know, uh, as good of a command on the English language as a lot of the other Formula One drivers. And from what I um, have learned, um, a lot of the English words he does know. He has learned from his engineers and mechanics, which is not exactly the best place to learn English terms, um, you know, um, if you're going to be speaking the language. So I think we need to add in that context. But also the person he called that is not disabled. So I think we also need to remember that if the other uh, the, the driver he called that was autistic or had some sort of, you know, um, you know, ADHD or something like that, and he called him that, then yeah, absolutely wrong and should be fined heavily. But I think, again, I think people are being harsh and I hope that people um, don't hold this against him, you know, going forward because I don't think he genuinely, you know, meant it in that way, in a bad way. Um, and again, I think people need to cut him slack given that he, uh, you know, English is not his first language and given the context of the situation. But again, if you're disabled people out there and you're offended by it, again, I completely understand, you know, when I've been called it by people, it really does hurt. But I feel like with the context of me being called it, it's a lot more justifiable in terms of it being offensive given that, you know, uh, I actually am disabled uh compared to uh the person sonoda called it so yeah um but yeah hopefully sonoda doesn't carry over any hate going forward and hopefully people can just move on after that but uh yeah that's pretty much all i want to talk about for the austrian grand prix what happened over the course of the weekend um, and yeah, thank you guys very much for listening to this. I will, if these, um, I'm probably going to do another one of these after the British Grand Prix, whether I do a qualifying or race watch along or not, we'll have to see. Um, if these though, if you guys enjoy these and you want these to continue, then eventually, maybe in a couple of weeks, I'll try putting them on Spotify so you guys can just listen to them rather than have to go onto YouTube and, you know, uh, do it that way. And I know, you know, for uh, for just listening, Spotify is easier. So, yeah, maybe if this is a, is a success, maybe I'll do that. And we'll see about that going forward. 
But um, in terms of the plan for content coming up this weekend, again, we'll have to see after Friday practice what things are looking like. Uh, you know, if it does look like Red Bull and McLaren are very close on pace after Friday practice, then I will be live on Saturday afternoon for qualifying. And then if we get an exciting enough grid, then of course I'll be live for the race. But I will probably do a podcast follow-up uh, the day after the British Grand Prix as well. And yeah, we'll just see how these go and whether you guys actually enjoy these and want these to continue. As I'm going to try, now I'm not at uni, I'm going to try and um, increase the content again on the channel uh, step by step, especially when it's, you know, um, not direct race weekend stuff. So yeah, we'll see how that goes going forward but until the british grand prix maybe i'll see you live for either qualifying or the race but if not then i'll probably see you for my british grand prix review podcast episode this time next week and until then guys it has been me chazer hd goodbye